Okay, let's go ahead and get started then. Um, welcome back. I hope you all had a chance to grab some lunch. Um, and this is then our afternoon sessions. We have three sessions, uh, one on Hindi, one on Urdu, and then the last one on um, Spanish. So our first speaker uh, this afternoon is Mansi Banjaj from Yale University. And the title of her talk is Open Textbook for Hindi Heritage Language Learners, The Plan. So we're going to listen to you, Mansi. What is the plan? Thank you so much, Carl. Um, I'm excited to share the plan with you all. <laughs> so but this is just the plan. This is like, you know, before I have even started talking, like, you know, working on it. Um, so there is a textbook that I want to work on for Hindi heritage learners, um, which of course um, is a different um, set of students from the foreign language learners. So it's not that there's no textbook available for learning Hindi. There are a lot of textbooks available and some of them are very good. For example, Rajiv Ranjan's book, which he will talk about in the next presentation, um, which is also an OER. And, uh, but those books are meant for foreign language learners. They're for uh, learners who are looking at Hindi language as a foreign language and they have not, um, they've not had an, uh, exposure to the language or as much to the culture before. So unfortunately, um, there's not been any book uh, for heritage language learners of Hindi. However, in many of the universities, such as at Yale, at University of Texas Austin, at um, Columbia, and some other universities, there is a separate track. There is a separate class for heritage language learners. So there's there's so much demand, but unfortunately, there is no book. Um, um, however, um, there's no book, but then even for foreign language learners, there's, um, you know, it'll be, uh, um, you know, the books that are available are not the books that a heritage language learner would be able to relate to, because both of them come from a very different background. For example, a foreign language learner will have to start from the beginning and will have to even learn how to, let's say, introduce themselves or have a basic conversation versus a heritage language learner already comes with, um, uh, with that knowledge. They know how to introduce themselves. They know how to carry on a basic conversation. Uh, it's just that their Hindi language either sometimes needs to be ironed out. There's some vocabulary uh, that needs to be developed or some grammar structure which needs to be um, um, like, you know, discussed. And um, they also have good understanding of the culture of the language. Uh, they also have um, a fair idea of politics, of Bollywood and so on. Therefore, what is needed for heritage language learners and what is needed for foreign language learner is very different. Therefore, there is certainly a need for um, a textbook for heritage language learners. Um, and then it's very important that um, the, the that we also include real life conversations. Um, so we do expose our students to literature. We do expose them to newspaper articles. But it's also very important that we actually give them um, a window into how native speakers at, uh, talk at the present moment, right? For example, like, you know, sometimes um, if, um, if you're watching, let's say, a movie, it is only representing a section or a class or um, a particular scenario. Um, whereas what you want your students, you, what you want to expose your students to is a different, like, you know, you want to expose them to the entire set. You want to expose them to speakers speaking Hindi in Jaipur, speakers speaking Hindi in Varanasi or Bihar, uh, Delhi, um, uh, Maharashtra um, and um, Tamil Nadu, right? So you don't want to restrict them to just one, um, one um, dialect of Hindi for that, for example. Right? So it's also very important that we have real life conversations included in the, in the textbook. And um, another thing is that when a student is learning language, they're not just learning language, but then they're also trying to see themselves, like, where do I fit in there, right? Where where do I, see, like, you know, when I'm learning a language, I'm, I always want to, like, also see that where am I fit, going to fit in that world, right? So that is also very important, like, those questions to answer. Therefore, um, so when you, when you, um, um, when um, you start or when um, thinking about writing a textbook or when you start even looking at textbook, there's a few decisions that one has to make. Uh, for example, like how are your readers going to navigate that book? 
is it meant for individual readers it is let let's say for a person like you know just to pick up that group like book and just should would i be able to work with that book by myself or do i need a group to practice it with or do i need a group to work on the book with what kind of um is this like book for self study can i just pick up that book and just start learning myself or do i need to be in a class do i need an instructor in addition to the book right so one has to make those decisions before you start working on the group then what kind of end result you are envisioning like which level like you know your you already understood that your students are coming with little background in law, um, in hindi so they they can they can have basic conversations they can put the point across but then where do you want to take them what is your end goal what are the learning outcomes going to be right um and then what kind of approach you want to um um adopt for uh, for for writing the textbook there's so many pedagogical approaches right like um for i am for example going to like you know these are the three that i am planning on incorporating in my book so i'm going to talk about those three so i am doing genre based language learning which means that the um concepts would be uh, genre based so there's for example like the genres that we're going to talk about in the book that i'm mentioning um i will i will um talk further um in a little bit and then do you want it to be a grammar book or do you want it to be a literature book or um how or is it communicative approach what kind of approach are you taking so however i'm taking a communicative approach but then there's also other aspects that i'm adding to it i do also want my students to work on projects i do want my students to look at literature um in a genre based way i want them to learn vocabulary in genre based manner and i also want to expose my students to multimodality not just one way of input but then various um like the whole plethora of uh, options that we have i want my students to be exposed to that i want them to listen to the uh, to the hindi that they speak in bollywood i want them to listen to the hindi that they listen to in um in tv shows i want them to listen to uh, let's um, expose them to hindi that is spoken in new, um in um news channels i want them to also listen to hindi that people just uh, listen on social media right the kind of language they use on social media and so on right so i i do not want my students to be restricted to just like one way similarly for um, for reading i want them to definitely look at literature but then i also want to um, um them to look at like you know uh, the, the blogs that people are writing i want them to look at the newspaper articles i want them to look at like all of these um um like advertisements that are there the billboards that you see around you right so um and then one of the other decisions that you like you know when you talk about what the learning outcomes are going to be for it to actually work for it to be practical you also have to decide on how many weeks or how many months do you expect your students to dedicate um into this book for them to reach the outcomes that you are planning on how many hours each week are you expecting that the students would dedicate to the book or how many do you recommend that they dedicate to the book for them to reach the level where you want to take them so so um it's very important when you start talking about a book or when you start uh, about writing a book that you also make a manual on how to work with the group uh, with the book especially for the learners for instructors for teachers that may be teaching it so for the book that i am planning on um working so especially keeping in mind that it is for her it is going to be for heritage language learners one is that they do come with vocabulary as they can put their points across but then they do not they have very restricted vocabulary they have the habit of simplifying everything so it's very important to build on that vocabulary by introducing them to like the literary and formal vocabulary terms similarly pop culture um they do have fair understanding or um, exposure to bollywood they even know uh, like you know just culture um they also know what is happening in the country in terms of religion and politics but very often they just see one uh, perspective i'm not define like i mean i definitely have no rights to tell which perspective is right or not right i mean every student has to make that decision for themselves but um if i'm exposing if i'm making my students learn a language i would also be interested in exposing my students to the different perspectives not just restricting to one 
um, one perspective or like one um, understanding, but a broader understanding of um, the pop culture, right? So now this can also be embedded in the stories, in the literature or the short stories or the real life conversations that I'm hoping to record and expose my students to. So that is how you broaden their horizons and um, um, yeah. Um, next um, is that uh, this is what Gabriela um, from New York University talks about in her podcast with Bhavya Singh from UCLA that um, heritage learners, when you when you just talk to them, even if you're asking them a question, like even if they are very often, let's say, advanced in an advanced class and you ask them a question which is very abstract, they do answer it, but they simplify it a lot and they just break down um, you know, what they are trying to put across. So it's very important that we also, in the book, like when you're exposing them to literature, to all the readings, the different readings and the different um, uh, listening material, um, you know, through multimodality, it's very important that you also give them grammar explanation for, um, for at least certain concepts that they are struggling with. So, uh, for example, um, very often um, heritage speakers struggle with um, using subjunctives. They um, um, have uh, sometimes a hard time working with passives, um, postpositions being one of the most common, uh, like, you know, the oblique forms being one of the most uh, common struggle for heritage learners, right? So those definitely need to be explained to the students and there's absolutely, um, you know, um, uh, one should not hesitate from including grammar explanations, why, even if you're taking a communicative approach or project-based approach or multimodality or genre-based approach. So um, because every, different strategies work for different students, and then what, when you're writing a book, you're not catering to this one student, but a, uh, but a lot of students, right, who are going to benefit out of the book. So also when you're writing the book, of course, as we go and look at the themes or genres that we're going to talk about, we will see that how they go from more concrete to more abstract as you progress through the book. And as for the interactive component, um, so I'm hoping to include, um, you know, activities or, um, um, you know, through H5A and then um, um, some projects will be there uh, that the students that would give students an opportunity to actually engage with the community and learn more about what is happening in the society at the present moment. Um, and therefore, it's very important that we include the interactive component and, um, well, how much a student gains out of the book is absolutely on them, but as, um, as a writer or author of a book, it's very important that you include or you give them that those options to indulge in the language, to indulge in the community, to indulge in the culture as much possible. So there will definitely be, I would um, definitely include some activities, projects, and tasks for the students to, um, you know, to involve them or to give them chance or, um, you know, um, fair um, chance to indulge or like um, uh, engage in the community. So um, as I just talked about, um, like, you know, adopting genre-based um, language learning. So the first part of the book, I'm hoping that the book would be in two parts. And the first part of the book, which is what I'm currently working on, will begin with the first chapter or the first part of the book, which is talk about reading and writing. The students, however, do come with the um, uh, with speaking and listening abilities, they very often do not know how to work with Devanagari script, the script that um, um, Hindi is written in. And then so it's very important to familiarize them with the script to make them comfortable with reading and writing. What is very um, nice is that uh, the students already know a lot of words that they would be reading later on, right? So it makes reading and writing, um, I believe, slightly quicker um, or easier for the students. So you would have to approach from a different perspective. For example, if I'm introducing them the sounds g, and this is how you write g, and then when I introduce r, I can then actually give them the example g, and they would immediately know what that word means. Versus for a foreign language learner, you would have to explain what g means. You would be that with the help of a picture or some other way, right? But for um, for a heritage learner, they would know how to pronounce it. They would know it's ghar. Um, and then they would also know what it means. 
Um, so the second, um, um, well, pretty much the first genre that I would be starting with is childhood. So how their childhood, um, you know, was and what were their dreams, um, um, you know, during childhood. And then you could also go on talking about child labor. The next theme would be college life. That is where you talk about relationships. You talk about academics. And from there, you progress to talking about professional life, um, which also comes with the need to um, balance stress with, um, with you know, um, regular life and so on. Um, next theme is then family, where you talk, talk about joint versus nuclear family. You know, you bring in all the culture there. You talk about like how things were done originally and how they're done now and like what is expected of when you are, um, you know, uh, living in Indian society and so on. Um, and then you also talk about generation gap, because if there is a, new, if a joint family living all together, then every generation may have a different way of thinking and then how things proceed then right so you know, there's beautiful literature on it and you can expose students using that and then I would um, finish that with the last um, theme of, or last genre which would be aging and it's very interesting that um, to see two aspects in it one is that how when they talk about aging how they show it from men's perspective and women's perspective is very different what is expect and then the second thing is what does society actually expect of you once you are um you know uh, slightly in the older age um and um anybody who's learning the language would also appreciate feedback um well if it is an oer you I would keep an open channel where the students can actually record their voice. They can um, write, um, you know, their answers and send it to me. Some of the activities will just give them instant feedback. But what is also very important is self-evaluation. Why? Because you can get it instantly and then you need it at like your regular steps. There's no, um, you know, you need evaluation to keep growing. So it's very important to understand like the students, um, you know, one of the ways is to participate. Right, you can give them uh, reflections. Auntie, yes, auntie, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think we are really out of time. Mm -hmm. um, um, I'll wind up in two minutes or maybe okay. one. Yeah. So what I mean by participation does not mean like, you know, it's if it's not a class, it does not mean that you cannot participate. You can still participate. For example, you can elaborate on the things. You can express, you can generate, or you can um, you know, express your curiosity about things. You can do more research on a particular topic and that is participation. So you can, um, you know, if, if there's some blogs or vlogs that you're listening to, if you're li uh, liking them or you're linking some contributions or you're summarizing, that is participation. If you have cause and effect questions, those are observations. Those That is all uh, participation. So participation does not restrict itself to being in class and then um, just speaking in there, right? And um, there are so many other activities that one could, um, you know, include in the book to encourage that participation. You could just ask them to draw um, outline guides or concept maps. You could ask them, you know, uh, instead of having teacher focus to learn a focus, ask them to write a letter at the beginning of the, um, like, you know, a lesson. And then after the lesson, what, like, what have they learned about it and so on. So there's... Um, so a few points that um, you know are very important is that uh, the book should be relevant, relatable, and appropriate to the students, depending on what fee what background they're coming from. So therefore, there is a very dire need for um, for a separate book for heritage language learners, depending on what interests and life experiences they have had, uh, which may be very wide in itself, but they're certainly very different from the experiences, let's say, that a foreign language learner is going to have. And um, with that, um, I'll just conclude the um, presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mansi.